Dead America, the second month, the SoCal Mission, part six. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by Aaron Smith. Chapter One. Thirteen hours remain. Preston, Garrett, and Charlie sat in a dimly lit office, the only light source coming from a couple of flashlights sitting on one of the two desks. It had only been a few minutes since they found themselves forced into this situation. Just on the outside of a poorly constructed door were dozens, maybe even hundreds of zombies, including a runner. Sergeant Wrangle, the man who had led them on countless dangerous missions over the years, and who had taken them right to the precipice of this mission objective. The shock of his loss still reverberated inside the men, especially Charlie, who had been saved by Wrangle's brave actions. It took several more moments before Charlie stood up, grabbing one of the flashlights off of the desk and using it to help him sift through everything that had been in the room. What you up to, Charlie? Preston asked. We can't just sit here, the doctor argued. We need a plan, and first things first, we need to know everything we can about this facility. I'm hoping someone had a map or layout, so at least we know where we're going. The two privates snapped out of their shocked trances, coming back into the present. All right, you work on that, Garrett said hoarsely. Preston and I will figure out what we have to work with. The private in question nodded. Everything on the table? he asked. Yep, Garrett replied. The duo took out every weapon asset they had. Bullets, guns, blades, and one pipe bomb and thermite device hit the desk. Unfortunately, it didn't take too long before everything was out of their possession. Well, this is less than encouraging, Preston huffed. Garrett shrugged. Could be worse, he drawled. We could have nothing. The two of them looked over the sparse offerings on the table, which consisted of three blades, one bag of handgun bullets, two handguns, and one rifle with a handful of bullets. They counted everything out. One full mag plus four bullets for the sidearms, Garrett reported. Six rifle rounds too, Preston said. Garrett sighed. Pretty safe to say we aren't shooting our way out of this one, he said. Split the handgun rounds up, Preston suggested. His companion shrugged. As long as you're good with me having the rifle, he asked. You're a better shot than me anyway, Preston pointed out. Not sure it's going to make much difference in here, since everything is going to be a point-blank range, Garrett muttered. You never know, Preston replied with a heaping dose of forced brightness in his tone. The banging on the window and door to the office intensified, forcing the duo to turn their attention towards the growing mass of ghouls outside. This does lead to another problem, Garrett said. Preston huffed an exasperated laugh. Only one more problem? Well, the biggest one, Garrett corrected. We gotta worry about Sarge. It's gonna be hard enough getting away from this mob, but they're shamblers. A runner in the mix really complicates things. Maybe the mob out there took enough bites to slow him down, Preston said. But he didn't sound convincing to anyone. Garrett swallowed hard. It's horrific to think about. But Sarge was already gone by the time that second one took a bite out of him, he said slowly. Those things are pickier eaters than my six-year-old niece, so there's a good chance he's going to be mobile, especially given all the noise we made getting in here. So what do we do about it? Preston asked. Not like we can pick him out of the crowd and take him out, and we can't really wait for him to slow down. Garrett thought for a minute before reaching down and moving the desk slightly. It was sturdy, heavy wood with some metal braces underneath. He looked around the room, doing some measurements and math in his head. Yeah, he finally said, sounding mostly confident. I think that could work. Your tone of voice scares me, Preston said dryly. Last time I heard that tone, I'm pretty sure I spent part of the evening hanging out of a window. What are you thinking? These desks are sturdy, Garrett said, bringing his knuckles down to knock on one of them. 
and the hallway outside is narrow enough that those things won't be able to get enough weight behind them to break through. I should hope not, his companion retorted, since we're currently relying on the desk for protection. Nah, we're relying on the door for protection, Garrett said, waving a hand. The desk is extra, but when we move the one Charlie's working on against the wall and put it up against this one so we can crack the door open a few inches, Preston began to nod as he put two and two together, shaking his head and putting his hand to his forehead like he had a raging migraine. Oh, this is not going to end well, he moaned. Yeah, we'll be fine, Garrett scoffed. Just gotta make sure we don't drop that machete, since it's our only weapon with reach. Preston took a deep breath. So you want to crack the door, and then what? he asked. Start stabbing them through the opening? It's the only play we got, Garrett replied. That's great and all, but the front door is wide open and we have no idea how many of those things are already in here, the other soldier insisted. It could take days to kill them all this way. Don't need to kill them all, Garrett corrected. Just need to get Sarge. Eliminating a run of threat is the only thing I'm concerned about. Preston sighed and shook his head. Okay, but what's our next move after that, he asked. We're still trapped in the room. Well, we do have some explosive options, Garrett replied, running a finger down the pipe bomb. But until we know where we're going, no sense in planning. Speaking of, Preston said, glancing over his shoulder, how are you coming over there, Charlie? The doctor had a stack of papers in front of him, sifting through a variety and tossing some to the ground, but keeping a few on the table. Making some headway. Charlie replied. Just need to piece it all together. Just let us know when you're ready, Preston said. The doctor went back to work, and the soldiers moved to the window, looking out at the mob. Garrett took his flashlight from the table and shone it through the glass. He couldn't get much of an angle, but it was enough to see that the hallway was packed in both directions with ghouls. Both men shook their heads at the sight. That does not look fun, Garrett murmured. Preston rose up next to him and pointed. Check out that guy, he said. Second row on the left. Garrett squinted at the normal-looking zombie, what had once been a middle-aged man with a few bite marks and some serious decomposition. What about him? he asked. Look at his lanyard, Preston urged. Garrett shone the light onto him and the lanyard around his chest. San Onofra Nuclear Power Plant. Staff. The tag boasted and he flicked the light around to as many chests as he could see, finding a few more lanyards. Got more of them, he said. Might explain why there are so many of those things in here. Not the worst play you could make, Preston said. Government facility, built to withstand direct missile hits so you know it's secure. And a high-value target, Garrett agreed, so you know you'd be high up on the rescue list, you know, assuming we actually had the capacity to launch one of those. Preston chuckled, shaking his head. Yeah, hell, man. In those early days, we were just lucky to survive a day in rural Kansas, let alone make a raid like this, he added. Hey, Charlie, any idea how many people worked at this facility? Garrett called. The doctor didn't even look up from his sorting and studying. Couple hundred, at least, he replied flatly. Couple hundred, huh? Garrett mused. Get their families and friends here. We could easily have hundreds, if not a thousand of those things locked in here with us, not including the ones outside coming in. I can't imagine how terrifying that would have been, Preston said with a shudder. Locked in here? Limited power and runners roaming the halls? One infected person with a bite or the wrong blood type, and it's a chain reaction of carnage. Yeah, and now we get to fight our way through them, Garrett quipped. Going God only knows where. I can answer that, although you might not like it, Charlie piped up. Preston sighed. Well, if nothing else, this mission is consistent, he said dryly. What you got for us, Charlie? Garrett asked. The doctor laid out multiple pieces of paper, showing various outlines of the facility. Some were basic maps, while others had blueprint-style markings. He showed the appropriate papers while he talked, pointing things out. Okay, this is the basic layout of the facility, Charlie began. 
Both soldiers approached the desk, and Garrett let out a low, impressed whistle at the multiple pages. Preston shook his head, rubbing his chin. There's four floors, all going down, Charlie explained. Our target is the third floor, as the bottom floor is maintenance and machinery. Best I can tell, this floor is a combination of office space, storage, and some rooms I can't tell what they are. Any theories? Preston asked with a shrug. Or does it matter? Until we know how we're getting to the control room, everything matters, Garrett replied. I can't be certain, but most likely they were maintenance rooms for the older facility. Pre-renovations, Charlie explained. No telling what's in them now, if anything. Either way, it can't be good for us, Preston said. Garrett cocked his head. Why not? he asked. If they're filled with old equipment, we're not getting in, his companion explained. If they were cleared out and empty, chances are they were used by the people trying to ride this thing out here. Garrett complained for a few moments before nodding. Damn, you're right, he muttered. Still, we need to know what we're up against if we can. So, what's below us? Preston asked. Looks like the second floor is where the bulk of the work took place, Charlie said. A couple of offices over to the side, employee areas, dining, all that. And it's big, too. How big? Garrett asked. Charlie tilted his head back and forth. If I'm reading this right, a couple hundred square yards broken up into several rooms, with a big open area in the middle. Any idea what's in the open area? Preston asked. Charlie shook his head. Not a clue, he admitted. Could be truly open, could be machinery. We really won't know until we get there. Speaking of, any ideas on how we're going to manage that? Garrett prompted. Got a couple of options, Charlie said slowly none of which are particularly appealing. It really boils down to, do you want to take the stairs or the elevator? The soldiers exchanged a look, neither of them particularly happy about the options. You sure there aren't any worker hatches hidden somewhere? Preston asked. Not that I can find, Charlie replied, shaking his head. But I'll keep looking while you guys take care of... He motioned to the door, hesitant and fearful. Take care of... you know... Yeah, we know, Garrett said dryly. Preston clapped his hands together. So, what do you think? he asked. Stairs or elevator? We have to assume those things are everywhere. So the question is, where do we want to stand our ground if it comes to that? Garrett asked. Preston shrugged. We're on the ground floor, so the stairwell door will open towards us, he said. So if we can get to it and get it shut, we'll be sealed off from them. Then we just have to contend with potentially dozens of those things on the stairs, Garrick replied, with one machete and two knives. Yeah, we'll have the high ground, but we're gonna have to get real close to do any damage. Preston wrinkled his nose. True, but I like the prospect better than getting on an elevator, he admitted. God only knows what is waiting for us when those doors open. Well, it's not like the doors would open on their own, Charlie piped up. This facility is running on emergency power, so it's unlikely the elevator is operational. His eyes widened and he nodded to himself, rifling through papers and folders on the side of the desk. Hang on, hang on, he murmured. The soldiers glanced at each other and then waited patiently as he pulled out a folder labeled New Plant Emergency Procedures and flipped through it before slamming it down on the table and pointing to a specific passage. We know where the elevator is, he declared. The soldiers leaned over to look and Garrett read aloud, In the event of emergency power, the elevator will move to the lowest position in the shaft for safety reasons. Which in this case is the control room level, Charlie said, tapping his finger on it. No elevator access to the bottom floor? Preston asked. The doctor shook his head. Not according to the plans, he replied. Looks like the only access is from the control room floor and it's stairs only. Garrett took a deep breath, nodding. That is a useful bit of information, he said. How do you figure? Preston asked. Well, we know if we can get those doors open, then there's a good twenty, twenty-five foot drop onto a hard surface awaiting them, Garrett replied. His companion nodded slowly. Okay, I'm with you, he said. A lot easier to grab and shove than land a headshot, 
especially with the emergency lighting situation. So, what do you think? Garrett asked. We clear the floor, or at least weed them out a bit, then hit the stairs? If the stairs are manageable, that's great, Preston replied. If we're overwhelmed, we can lead them back up and dump them down the shaft. Garrett nodded. I've heard worse ideas, he admitted. All right, now all we have to do is take out a runner, get out of this room, and run down a hallway that is potentially filled with hundreds of those things, get the elevator doors open, and shove them in without going over the edge ourselves. Preston gushed, gasping for air at the end. Or get eaten, Charlie added brightly, like a kid excited to contribute to a conversation. The soldiers glanced over at him, and he withered under their gazes. I'll stop helping, he said. By all means, Charlie, help all you want, Garrett quipped. Just stick to what you're good at. The doctor nodded sharply. Ten-four, good buddy, he said. Garrett cocked a brow, and Charlie raised his palms in surrender. I'll stop that too, he promised. Okay, we have something that could pass for a plan, Garrett said, clapping Preston on the shoulder. Help me get this desk in position, and we'll start taking those things out. Chapter 2 Eleven and a Half Hours Remain Garrett stood by the table, trying to aim his machete through the six-inch opening in the door as a bevy of hands reached through. Come on, come on, he chanted, lining up the tip of his very bloody blade with the forehead of a creature. Once he was satisfied with his aim, he put his palm against the back of the hilt and jammed it forward. The machete cracked the front of the skull and dropped the corpse. He held on tightly to the blade to make sure he didn't lose it. All right, another one down, Garrett said. Still no sign of Sarge. It's been more than an hour, Preston replied. Maybe they got him after all, and he's not mobile? Garrett shook his head. Going to give it a little longer, he said. Besides, you guys aren't ready to go yet, are you? He glanced back at Charlie and Preston who were using a small toolkit they'd found in the drawers to dismantle some of the metal tracking that was used to guide the drawers in and out. There was a small pile of them on the desk. Only have two more to do, Charlie said. No more than ten minutes. Garrett shrugged. Well, that gives us a few more chances, he said. How many you up to? Charlie asked. That was number twenty-three, the soldier replied. Preston cocked a brow. You kill too many more, and we're not going to be able to get out the door, he said. How are we doing that again? Charlie piped up. I don't think I've heard a plan. Still trying to figure that one out, Garrett huffed, returning to his task. All right, bring on the next contestant for everybody's favorite game show. Who wants to get stabbed in the face? A younger-looking zombie missing most of its left cheek stepped up. In the early days, a sight like this would have upset Garrett. But at this point he was so numb to the rotting, walking corpses of what had once been human beings. As he lined up his attack, he glanced past and spotted Wrangle upright and staggering about. Got eyes on Sarge, Garrett muttered. Preston moved over to the door, peering out. It took him a moment before he spotted the sergeant, with milky eyes and blood soaking his whole body. I'll be damned, the private murmured. Good thing I took my time, Garrett said. Well, just don't take too much more, Preston grumbled. We're still on the clock. Garrett went back to his task, aiming his blade and taking down the zombie in front of him. Come on, Sarge, get up here, he muttered. Another ghoul stepped up in front of him, and he stabbed it in the eye. Rather than waste more time or risk Wrangle walking away, he got up onto the desk taking a knee so he was elevated, and pulled out his rifle. He aimed carefully, but the emergency lighting was poor. Preston, I need light, he hissed. Now! The private grabbed his flashlight and shone it out into the crowd. Garrett found his target, tracking Wrangle for a couple of seconds to steady himself before holding his breath and pulling the trigger. The sound of the blast was deafening in the small room, and all three men winced in pain at their rattling eardrums. Thankfully, the bullet ripped through Zombie Wrangle's head, 
dropping him to the floor. Garrett let out a deep, shuddering breath. Rest in peace, Sarge, he murmured. We'll finish the mission. He took a beat and then turned back to the others, who were using a roll of masking tape to secure the ten railings together into one single piece. It was about three feet long and eight inches in diameter. Well, that's something, I suppose, he quipped. It's lightweight, sturdy, and extends my reach by a few feet, Charlie protested. I'd rather a zombie grab this than my arm when I'm trying to shove them away. Garrett raised a hand. Can't argue with that, he agreed. So it's been an hour and a half, Preston said, clearly agitated. You come up with a way to get us out of here yet? Garrett shook his head. Outside of picking these off one by one, I got nothing, he admitted. Open to ideas. Got that pipe bomb, Preston suggested. Toss it out the crack in the door and hope for the best. All that's going to do is create a gap in the mob out there, Garrett replied, shaking his head. That'll get us out the door, but then we'd be surrounded. Preston shrugged. It would give us a fighting chance, though, he said. Garrett frowned. There are thirty or forty of those things on either side of the door, and that's just what I can see, he said. If they're all in front of us, that's one thing. We can manage that. Fight and push through to the other side. But that bomb would only buy us a few seconds on that rear flank. Charlie gasped as if he had thought of something, and turned to inspect the back desk a bit more, feeling the top and wiggling it around, finding it a little loose. I think I can buy us some time he said. How so? Garrett asked. This desktop comes off, Charlie explained. We just have to take it apart. It's heavy as hell, fifty, sixty pounds all on its own. We slide it through the door and wedge it into the frame, and we have a makeshift barricade. Preston nodded slowly. Is that desk long enough to get across the hall? he asked. I don't think so, the doctor admitted, especially considering we're going to need to wedge it into the door to keep it in place. But instead of a wall of zombies coming at us, it'll be a conga line, which we should be able to handle, even if we have to burn a couple of rounds in the process. The soldiers glanced at each other and shrugged. Best idea I've heard, Preston said. Garrett nodded in agreement. So, we toss the pipe bomb, clear the area, slide the desktop in place and start pushing towards the elevators, he said. Those doors are going to be a bitch to open, Charlie said. Preston turned to him. Are they locked down? he asked. Charlie shook his head. Shouldn't be, he said. You just have to get them going, and there's no leverage on them. Garrett held out his combat knife with a big smile. One stab of this, and I'll have all the leverage I need, he declared. Looks like we got us a plan, Preston said. Garrett, why don't you work on getting that door closed, and Charlie and I will get this tabletop undone. Garrett nodded and grabbed the makeshift arm extender that they had built. What are you doing with that? the doctor asked, pausing. Gonna give it a try, Garrett replied with a grin. Need to poke at those corpses so I can get the door shut. Charlie smirked. I'm charging you a bag of chips rental fee, he joked. Garrett chuckled. If it keeps me from getting bitten, it's a price worth paying. Chapter 3 Ten and a half hours remain. Everybody in the room was hot and tired, working hard in there with no ventilation. The only air getting in was from underneath the door, and it reeked of rotted flesh. Finally, both desktops were removed, propped up against the wall right by the door. Garrett made a check, pretending to open the door and make sure there was enough clearance room. I think we're good here, Garrett said. Preston turned to Charlie. Where are we going once we're out of the room? He asked. The doctor held up a floor map in front of the light. Okay, we make a left out of here and go straight to the end of the hall, he said, motioning as he spoke. Right in front of us is going to be the stairs. The hallway comes to a T and we want to go to the right, heading down a little ways more, which is where the elevator is. So it's at the end of the hall then? Preston asked. Charlie nodded. Yeah, which is good and bad, he admitted. We'll only have to face those things from one direction, but we won't have a way to back up if we start to get overwhelmed. 
I'd rather fight a one-front war with our backs against the wall than a two-front war, Garrett said. Preston snorted. You say that now, he joked. Okay, you two help me move this desk away from the door, then get behind it, Garrett instructed. I'm going to light this thing and toss it out there. The moment it goes off, we gotta move. He stared firmly at the door. Charlie, for the love of the Almighty above, don't do anything stupid. Whatever comes our way, you let Preston and me handle it. Even if it's going to get us bitten, are we clear? Charlie took a deep breath, giving a reluctant but firm nod. Good, Garrett said, because we haven't come this far and lost so many of our friends to fuck it up now. He turned towards Preston. I'll take point when we get out there. They're going to be bunched up tight and all in a row. I have all five of those rifle rounds loaded up. I'm going to at least squeeze off two or three before we make a push. You keep an eye on our six. And once you're done shooting? Preston asked. Garrett shrugged. I'm hoping it's not going to be too packed in the hallway, he replied. My plan is to push through them and get to the elevator, get it open, and get ready to start throwing them in. But with the way our day is going, I fully expect to be fighting them hand to hand at the stairwell door. That's the spirit, Preston quipped and smacked him on the back, before helping Charlie move the desk away from the door. Just to make sure it was extra secure, Garrett leaned against it for support. He didn't think it would crack open, but he wasn't going to risk it. Once the two men were safely behind the desk, food bags slung over their shoulders, he nodded and pulled out his lighter. Hold on to your butts, gentlemen. This is about to get chaotic, he said, and lit the fuse. He immediately cracked open the door just wide enough to toss it over the first few ghouls. It clanked on the floor a few times before settling, slamming the door shut as it landed. As soon as the door was secure, he ran and jumped over the torn-up desk, ducking for cover behind the others. It was a painfully long few seconds as the banging on the door became more intense. Finally, the waiting was over, and the window shattered from the shockwave blowing the door wide open and sending debris and body parts flying into the room. The noise nearly destroyed their eardrums, making them a little woozy as they stood up. It took them a brief moment to regain their senses and get their bearings, but once they did, they leapt into action. Come on, let's move, Garrett barked and rushed out into the hallway, looking both ways for trouble. The pipe bomb had done a fantastic job of clearing the immediate area, about five yards on either side of the door, with nothing but torsos and random body parts strewn about. He turned to the left, facing a far more disappointing sight. There were easily a hundred zombies packed into the hallway, wide enough for five of the creatures to stand shoulder to shoulder. A few on the ground were still moving, missing some limbs, but still active. Garrett barked out information as Preston and Charlie got the desks secured in the doorway. Got movement on the ground, so watch your ankles, he cried, and raised the rifle, getting as close as he was comfortable with before aiming and firing. The rifle round punched through the first head like an overripe melon and took out a few more ghouls behind it. Garrett took a step back before doing it again and again. He repeated the process in the center, going a little deeper into the line. Even after four shots, it didn't look like he'd made much of a dent. Fuck it, he muttered, aiming and firing one more time in the middle, clearing it out a little more, but still only halfway through the pack. He was forced to pull out his handgun, not wanting to use his final bullets, but he knew he might not have a choice. We gotta move, he barked, looking back at the secured desktops. They had enough of a gap so that one or two zombies could push through and the duo ran up, skidding to a stop at the sight of the horror in front of them. What the fuck do we do? Preston demanded. Garrett froze for a moment before snapping into reality. He had to take charge, and there was only one thing they could do. Charlie, hold on to my belt like I'm a bucking bronco, he instructed. Preston, you help push me as hard as you can. We are going to run right through the middle of these things. Fuck, Preston muttered. Garrett shook his head. I'm not happy about it either, but this is what we got, he said. Now come on! The two men reluctantly got into position, 
the zombies slowly marching in, filling the gaps that Garrett's rifle shots had created. We're going, he bellowed, and swung his food bag around, holding it in front of him like a makeshift battering ram. He knew it wasn't going to do any damage, but it would make it harder for zombies to grab. He pumped his legs hard, building up a head of steam with the two other men right behind him. They put their heads down, and he led with the bag. They managed to find a path right down the middle of the hallway, stepping on fallen corpses as they went. The food bag-led caravan slammed into the first ghoul with such force that it knocked it off its feet and to the side. Garrett grunted and let out a primal scream as he pushed harder than he ever had before, the men behind him doing the same. They ran headlong into the throng of zombies, pushing through them with relative ease. Decrepit, outstretched hands attempted to grab the men, but came up empty as the soldiers moved with such force that the zombies couldn't get a good handhold due to the bags on their backs. Finally, and somewhat miraculously, they made it to the other side. They ran about ten more yards before stopping and looking back. Everybody good? Garrett asked, looking around. Just amazed that worked, Charlie gasped, shaking his head. Garrett switched to his knife, tossing his bag over his shoulder. Come on, let's get to the elevator, he urged, and they ran down the rest of the hallway. A few more zombies came around both corners, and Garrett slammed into the ones on the right, pinning them against the wall as the others came around. The pathway to the elevator was mostly clear, except for half a dozen ghouls spread out over the next thirty yards. The men were easily able to dispatch them as they got to the elevator doors. The emergency lighting was dim, so they flicked on the flashlights and aimed them down the hallway, hearing the moans and shuffling. Get that door open, Preston bellowed, and the soldier in question jammed his knife into the right side of the elevator door, piercing the thin outer layer of metal and going down all the way to the hilt. He put both hands on it and started to push, and as soon as there was a bit of an opening, Charlie shoved his hands in the gap. They both grunted in strained effort, but they managed to get the doors fully open. Garrett looked down, making sure the elevator was at the bottom, and it was, about a forty-foot drop. Charlie, I need you to stand in that corner and let Preston and me do some work, he instructed. If any of those things come near you, just shove it back to the middle and call out. He set his jaw, and his tone was as forceful as a jackhammer. Do not, under any circumstances, try to help us or push any of those things over the edge. Are we clear? Charlie nodded furiously as he backed up into the corner, the tone of the soldier's voice terrifying him into compliance. Garrett stepped up beside Preston, who had holstered all of his weapons, prompting Garrett to do the same. They looked down the hall towards the sounds of shuffling feet and moaning slowly marching closer to them. The flashlights were bright, and when combined with the emergency lighting, they could see the outlines of a huge mob coming their way, the edge of which was about forty yards away. How the hell are we going to do this? Preston asked, voice shrill. We gotta start getting them over the edge now, Garrett snapped. Come on! He led his companion towards the mob. Uh, buddy? Preston asked, voice unsure. The elevator shaft is back that way. And if we don't start thinning them out now, we're not going to last long. Garrett quipped as they grew closer, finding the mass of rotting flesh stretching back fifteen yards or so. You want to pull or stab? Preston's brow furrowed. What? he asked. We can't go in there and start stabbing, or we'll be overwhelmed, Garrett huffed. But we can certainly separate them from the mob and land a blow. So, you want to pull or stab? Preston nodded as flimsy as the plan was, and smacked his comrade on the arm. I'll pull, you stab. Garrett unsheathed his machete, allowing Preston to get a few yards in front of him. Once in position, they walked towards the mob, stopping in a patch of emergency light that was just a few yards away. Okay, get ready, Preston said. Garrett gripped his machete tightly, ready to strike. Preston, meanwhile, steadied himself, waiting on the front edge of the mob that was just a few yards away to get close. Within seconds, they started to come into focus, stepping into the light. They were lined up four across, all moaning and shuffling at different but similar speeds. 
Preston picked out his first target, a tall, lanky zombie a step ahead of the others. He darted forward, grabbing its arm and yanking hard. The creature stumbled forward, Preston using the momentum to turn and shove it back towards Garrett. As the ghoul managed to keep its balance, he lined up his attack. Garrett swung his blade across his body, slicing right through the top of the zombie's head. The creature stumbled around for a brief moment, the body not quite caught up to the brain trauma yet. He quickly shoved the beast aside, smacking it against the wall before it collapsed. Paul! he bellowed, like a skeet shooter ready for the next round. Preston immediately delivered, grabbing the next ghoul, an older gentleman in a white lab coat splattered with dried blood, pulling it out of the light. Garrett swung, removing its head. Two steps back, Preston barked. Garrett moved, nodding and keeping his stance loose. You're in charge. Call out the movements, he said. Preston nodded as he grabbed another shambling victim, tossing it back towards his partner. The two-man zombie elimination game went on for several minutes as they slowly inched backwards towards the elevator shaft. With each swing Garrett made, it seemed like the line behind them didn't diminish at all. How close are we? Preston asked. Garrett glanced back over his shoulder. Ten, maybe twelve yards, he replied. Preston looked over the top of the mob, finding the line still seven or eight solid yards of wall-to-wall -wall ghouls. We gotta speed this up, he cried. Garrett did some math in his head, figuring that they were close enough to the shaft to begin the lemming operation. Give me two, he called. Preston let out a grunt to acknowledge the order, and quickly reached out to grab an arm, yanking the ghoul out of the line. Before the creature was by him, he let go, reaching out to grab the next one and repeating the process. Two zombies stumbled back towards Garrett, following the same line. He grabbed the first one, shoving it a little further down the hallway, while he waited on the second creature. When the second one reached him, he quickly spun it around, grabbing it by the back collar and belt, shoving it forward with everything he had. He looked over its shoulder, making sure to line it up with the other one. Garrett quickly built up a head of steam with the grasped ghoul, slamming it into the first one he'd tossed aside. They collided violently, with Garrett using his strength and momentum to push the duo towards the shaft. Garrett was careful to keep an eye on where he was on the floor, not wanting to send himself careening over the edge, along with his victims. When he got within a couple of yards of the shaft, he gave them a forceful shove, sending them tumbling towards the doorway. The momentum was more than enough to send them over the edge, moans echoing in the shaft as they plummeted the forty or so feet to the bottom. A few seconds later, there was a definite thud ending the moans. Garrett didn't waste time immediately running back to Preston, who had taken several steps back while he was making the trash run. Next two, he yelled. Preston nodded, repeating the process of throwing two ghouls from the line back to Garrett, who grabbed them and pushed them towards their demise. Preston was forced to take several steps back. He looked over his shoulder, seeing that the distance to the elevator shaft was getting closer and closer. Knowing that they were going to run out of real estate well before they were able to throw them all overboard, he decided to buy them a few extra moments. Weapons hot, he cried, and drew his handgun, taking careful aim at the zombies in the front of the pack. He fired deliberately, making sure each bullet was a headshot. Preston knew his ammunition was extremely limited, and this was the only time he'd be able to use this move. But it was the only move to make, otherwise they'd be overwhelmed. He fired three times, taking out most of the front line, before pulling the fourth zombie on the line forward and throwing it back towards Garrett, who had just shoved his latest creature over the edge. He fired another trio of bullets, hitting the same positions he had the first time, only in the second row, hoping that two consecutive bodies on the floor would slow down the ones behind them a bit. He grabbed the next standing zombie that was ahead of the others, shoving it back into the other one that was behind him. And just in the nick of time too, as it was closing in on him. The two ghouls collided tangling up with each other face to face. As they struggled to free themselves, Garrett came around, shoving them towards the shaft. Preston appraised the mob, 
seeing that his plan had worked, at least a little bit. He bought a few precious seconds. He glanced over his shoulder, finding them about ten yards from the shaft, Garrett still several moments away from being ready for the next batch. Preston holstered his gun and grabbed his knife, pulling the next zombie forward, stabbing it in the head, and tossing the corpse to the side, then repeating the process with the next one, only tossing it to the other side. He knew it wasn't going to do much, but he hoped it would slow the creatures on the edge down just enough for them to get a handle on the situation. Pull! Garrett cried. Preston grabbed the next ghoul and threw it back before grabbing the second one. This process went on for a few more rotations before the mob began to close the gap, forcing them further and further back, until they were within five yards of the shaft. To buy a few extra seconds, Preston used the rest of his meager supply of bullets as Garrett got into position. He stood just off to the side of the shaft, only a few yards away from it. Start pulling them back as quickly as you can, he bellowed. Preston complied immediately, grabbing zombies one after the other. Rather than stack them up and push, Garrett simply shoved them towards the elevator, using their momentum to force them over. The first ghoul he shoved didn't quite go over the edge, stopping just short and turning his attention towards Charlie. Garrett! the doctor screamed. Garrett turned and grabbed the next zombie shoving it as hard as he could. The forceful push was just enough to send them both tumbling over the edge. The process continued as they shoved a dozen zombies to their demise, but continuing to back up. Preston looked over the top, estimating about thirty zombies left, but their safety area was just a few yards. We need to buy time, he yelled. Garrett thought for a moment before pulling off his heavy food bag. Move, he barked. Preston whirled just in time to see his partner spinning, building momentum with the heavy bag. He dove out of the way just as Garrett released it, sending the forty-pound canvas bag through the air at chest level. It slammed into the front edge of the zombies and ploughed through several of them, knocking half a dozen on one side to the ground. The other side continued marching towards the men, but it allowed them a chance to clear out one at least. They threw several more over the edge as the first batch of creatures managed to get back on their feet, falling a couple yards back from the front line. As this happened, Charlie pulled his bag off, sliding it over too. Garrett, bag, he called. Garrett looked down and snatched it up, doing the same things as before and taking out the same creatures a second time. This bought them enough time to send half a dozen more ghouls over the edge, leaving only a small handful of creatures who were either struggling to get back up from getting knocked down, or stumbling around the fallen masses. Garrett and Preston stood side by side, no more than five yards from the shaft, seeing they were in good shape and having a few moments before they'd have a creature within safe reaching distance. We're close enough now, just grab and throw, Garrett instructed. You got it, Preston replied. The two soldiers exchanged a fist bump, stepping up to finish the job. One by one they tossed the ghouls over the edge, stepping out of each other's way like dancers engaging in a routine. Several moments passed before Garrett grabbed the last zombie, giving it a forceful kick in the back, sending it over the edge. It moaned all the way down, but there wasn't a delightful thud, rather the smacking of wet, decaying flesh. Hand me that light, Garrett said, holding out his hand. Preston held out his flashlight to his companion, who took it and peered over the edge of the shaft. Well, that's a horrific mess, Garrett muttered. The others peeked their heads over, the same jaw-dropping reaction he had. Forty feet down was a collection of rotting flesh, splattered on the walls and stacked so high they couldn't see the elevators below. While the first creatures they'd thrown over most certainly had perished, the ones who'd landed on top of the others hadn't met the same fate. They were still clear moans and movement within the pile, but from that height they couldn't tell exactly how much. Hell of a job though, Puddy, Garrett said as he stepped back, handing back the light with a grin. Preston nodded as he took it. About to say the same thing to you, he said. Before they could relax any, 
Moans echoed from down the hallway, putting them on edge. Preston shone his light down the hall, but they didn't see anything. Garrett nodded for the others to follow and led them down there, picking up their food bags as they went. The duffel bags were a little stained with zombie gore, but were otherwise fine. Garrett led the way with his knife in one hand and flashlight in the other, tensing up when he reached the corner. He held up his hand, signaling the others to stop as he carefully peeked around, relying only on the emergency lighting to see. He didn't want to risk exciting any of the zombies down there. He stared carefully, noting that their desktop barricade had worked quite well. A few creatures had come around the edge of it, but most of them were still stuck behind it. The ones that had come around were fixated on the office they were hiding in, presumably attracted to the noise of the desks smacking against the doorframe. He listened carefully, hearing a large number of zombies behind it. He ducked back behind the corner, talking quietly. They're stuck on the barricade, he whispered. I think we're in the clear, at least for the moment. What do you say we keep an eye on them and take five? Preston asked softly. I need a moment to catch my breath after that bullshit we just survived. Garrett nodded. No argument for me, he replied. I'll keep watch. You have a seat. Preston collapsed in a heap, his back against the wall, closing his eyes for a moment to steady himself and get a few moments of precious rest before they began their descent to the lower levels. Chapter Four. Ten hours remain. Garrett continued to peek out from behind cover, making sure the zombies at the barricade continued to stay in their place. After several minutes of resting, he tapped Preston on the shoulder, who was still on the ground, catching his breath. Come on, man. We're in the home stretch, Garrett murmured. We'll have plenty of time to rest once we get Charlie here to the control room. Finally give him a chance to do the heavy lifting on this mission. Charlie nodded. There definitely will be plenty of time to relax, he said. It could take me hours to get things back to where they need to be. Yep, come on. We aren't getting paid by the hour, Garrett said, checking his watch. Let's get him there so he has time to work. Yeah, yeah, Preston groaned and extended his arm so the other two could help him up. Once he was on his feet and had his food bag situated, the trio moved quietly over to the stairwell door. Keep an eye on our friends down the hall, Garrett said, nodding to Charlie. If any one of them so much as looks our way, I want to know about it. You got it, the doctor replied. So, how are we doing this? Preston asked. Garrett thought for a moment and then handed his machete to his partner. I got a few pounds on you, so I'll hold the door in place, he said. We have to assume we have company on the other side. Preston took the machete, getting a feel for it. Let's hope it's a light crowd, he muttered. Damn straight, Garrett replied with a nod. Okay, here we go. He planted his foot down about a foot away from the door, anchoring it to the ground as hard as he could. He put a hand on the handle, ready to turn and yank it open. You ready? he asked, and Preston nodded sharply responding in the affirmative. Garrett took a breath and turned the handle. As soon as he did, the door slammed open and into his foot. The impact was so great and with such weight that it scooted him back six more inches, leading to a very dangerous situation at the door. Several arms jettisoned out, grabbing at Preston, who began swinging wildly. Rather than stab like Garrett had done at the office door, he brought the blade down in a panic, hard onto the top of the lead ghoul's head, with such force that it embedded into its skull. Rather than drop straight down, another zombie behind yanked the creature back to get up to the front, yanking the machete out of Preston's hand. Fuck! the soldier cried. What? Garrett screamed from pressing his face against the door, holding on for dear life to keep it closed. I lost the machete! Preston hissed. Damn it! Garrett groaned. Uh, guys, Charlie said shakily, they see us. Garrett rolled his head so he could glance back, seeing the zombies starting to come their way. They were in trouble. Both he and Preston were low on energy, and not in a position to pull the shaft game again, 
especially with the potentially hundreds more coming from behind the desk barricade. How many are in the stairwell? Garrett asked. Preston looked over their heads, standing on tiptoe. Five, maybe six on the landing, he said. Can't see the stairs, so don't know. Garrett grunted again, formulating a terrible plan on the fly. Stand back and follow my lead, he said. I'm going to clear the landing. You worry about getting that door shut. Charlie, you find the railing and stay away from anything moving. Preston pushed Charlie back a couple of steps, knowing this was about to get dangerous. Once they were clear, Garrett jumped back, allowing the door to slam open. The first few zombies that had been pushing tumbled over, hitting the ground hard. As soon as they were down, Garrett leapt over them, getting into the stairwell. There were three more zombies on the landing, which was fairly wide with a railing on the far side that overlooked the stairs below. Rather than fight, Garrett went into linebacker mode, getting low and extending his arm, grabbing two of the creatures that were side by side. He shoved them towards the railing, lifting up as he did. He slammed them into the third one, straining to get them off of the ground. As they gnashed their teeth and poured at him, he pressed them against the railing before giving them one forceful shove. He gathered enough strength to send the trio tumbling over the top rail, and they flailed helplessly as they crashed into the zombies below, which were more than he would like to see. As Garrett did all of that, Preston and Charlie jumped the fallen zombies and got into the stairwell. Charlie did as instructed, getting to the railing and hugging it. Preston, meanwhile, crossed the threshold, but as he turned his attention to the door to get it closed, he noticed a zombie on the top step, reaching out for him. Instinctively, he delivered a forceful front kick, sending it falling backwards. Rather than a thud, it was the sound of flesh hitting flesh as the creature landed on half a dozen other creatures that were shuffling up the stairs. Preston was worried, but that problem was on the back burner as he turned to the zombies at the door, who were not only blocking it from being shut, but was starting to get up. Preston kicked a zombie in the back, sending it stumbling forward and knocking another one out of the way. He reached out, grabbing the emergency door release and pulling it towards him. Before it closed, a set of zombie hands reached in and grabbed it. He pulled hard, slamming the creature's hands between the door and the frame. While the creature wasn't a threat to bite, he was still panicked at not being able to shut the door. He strained to keep it pulled towards him. He glanced down the stairs, finding the ghouls starting to get back up, so he knew his time was short. He pulled out his handgun, aiming through the opening at the zombie's head. He pulled the trigger, but there was nothing but a dull click. Gun! Gun! he shrieked. As soon as he called out, Garrett spun around, drew his, and aimed through the door, pulling the trigger. The bullet ripped through the zombie's face causing it to let go and fall back. Preston jerked the door shut and secure, followed almost immediately by corpses banging on it. You okay? Garrett asked. Preston nodded. Yeah, he huffed. Good, because this shit's just getting started, Garrett said, motioning towards the railing. Preston peered over, letting out a defeated sigh as he looked down at the dozens of creatures spread out on the stairs all marching up towards them. How many people were hiding in here? he asked, exasperated. Garrett shook his head. Way too many, he said, and picked up his machete from the zombie it had been stuck in. He tossed the body down the stairs, slamming into the ghouls and pushing them all down to the landing below them. This brought them several moments to get situated. Garrett glanced over his shoulder at Charlie. Got a job for you, he said. The doctor nodded from his perch at the back railing. What do you need me to do? he asked. Don't know how effective it's going to be, but I want you to get in the middle of the railing there and look over the edge, Garrett said. Make as much noise as you can. Charlie nodded slowly. Because maybe those things will look up at me? he asked. One can only hope, Garrett said. Maybe buy us a little time so we don't get overwhelmed. I'm on it, Charlie replied and leaned over the edge yelling at the top of his lungs. Hey, yo, up here. Yeah, that's right. Look at me. His voice echoed in the stairwell, 
catching the attention of several of the ghouls that were climbing up the stairs to the next landing. They looked up, stretching their arms out in vain, moaning with excitement at the first sight of fresh meat in over a month. As the zombies did that, several others nearby did the same thing, planting their feet on the stairs, blocking the path for any others to come up. Charlie glanced over, finding that the soldiers hadn't engaged the other mob in battle yet, the zombies still getting to their feet and coming up slowly. Carrot? he asked. The soldier turned towards him. Yeah? Look at this, Charlie said, waving him over. Preston nodded, inclining his head, and Garrett broke formation to run over, looking down. Oh, good job, Garrett said. Charlie cocked his head. Don't they look like they could use a crowd surfer? he asked. Garrett grinned, wagging a finger at the doctor. When you hear me yell, you back up quick to that railing, you understand? he instructed. First sound I hear from you, I'm out of here, Charlie promised. Garrett made it back to the line, looking down the stairs at three zombies slowly coming up about halfway to them. Two were side by side and one was a couple of steps back. Behind them were eight more creatures on the landing that were preparing to make their ascent. When those two get close, knock the one on the left back, Garrett said. What about the other one? Preston asked. I'm sending his big ass over the railing. Take out a few of his buddies, Garrett replied. Works for me, Preston said. The two soldiers got into position as the zombies came up the stairs. When they were within range, Garrett tapped Preston and the soldiers leapt into action. One swift kick to the chest sent his ghoul flying back, launching into the air and landing with a thud on the corner of the stairs, head splitting open. Garrett, meanwhile, grabbed the other zombie by the arm, jerking it forward onto the landing. Charlie! he bellowed. The doctor broke away from the rail, getting out of the way, as Garrett shoved his charge towards it. Adios! he quipped and flipped the six-foot-tall corpse over the top rail, sending it careening down to his awaiting friends. Garrett looked over and saw three of the zombies below crushed under the weight of the big zombie. The sounds of broken bones and muffled moans echoed up to them, and Garrett motioned for Charlie to take up his position again. Get them occupied again, he instructed. This is going to work great. Garrett went back to the line, where Preston was kicking another one back down the stairs, breaking a few bones, but the head stayed intact. Damn, I was hoping that would work, Preston muttered. You'll get her with the next kick, Garrett quipped. Besides, we're doing good on time. Just have to get to the bottom of those stairs, so no need to kill ourselves. Preston nodded, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. Well, that door is secure, and based on the banging, they're already pressed against it, he said. Don't have the foggiest idea how we're getting out of here, but I do know they're not getting in. Got a good crowd over here, Charlie called. Looks like we get another jumper, Garrett said, and Preston nodded, the two soldiers getting into position to do the same maneuver again. Chapter 5 Nine hours, fifteen minutes remain. Preston kicked one more creature down the stairs, where it cracked its head on the pavement below. Garrett, tired of stabbing, picked the last ghoul up, a young teenage boy, and pile drove it into the stairs. Charlie winced as the skull, neck, and several other bones shattered on impact. They stood on the second floor landing, the two soldiers breathing heavily, surrounded by lifeless corpses that had been rotting for weeks. The stench was unbearable, even more so than usual thanks to them being trapped in a relatively warm stairwell. As they stood there, Charlie walked over to the second floor door, putting his ear against it and listening for trouble. Anything? Preston asked quietly. I can hear some moans, but nothing that's coming our way, Charlie replied. Yet. Garrett chewed his lip, looking down the landing and the stairs at the couple dozen bodies on the ground. I don't think anyone is going to be happy with this idea, but we need to barricade that door, he said. With what? Preston asked, but his dry tone suggested he already knew the answer to that. Some dead weight, Garrett replied, motioning to the corpses below. 
I swear I'm sleeping for a damn week once we get into the control room, Preston groaned. And if there is a god, he'll let me die in my sleep because I'm so over this zombie stuff. You'll have to excuse Preston, Garrett said to Charlie. He gets cranky when he doesn't get his nap. Preston wanted to throw back a witty retort, but was too tired to do so, instead opting to shake his head in disgust and pointing to one of the bodies on the ground as if it was the one he wanted to start with. All right, let's get to it, Garrett said. Charlie, carefully go down to the next door. Watch where you step. Everything should be dead, but don't take any chances. Just listen for anything that might cause us trouble. The doctor nodded. Will do he said. We won't be long, Garrett replied. Just going to lay a few hundred pounds on the door. We can reinforce it later. Charlie nodded and started to slowly walk down the stairs as the soldiers got to work. He carefully stepped around zombies that were clearly dead, ones that were missing chunks of skull or stabbed in the face. There was one on the landing below him which led to a set of stairs that took him to the door the final door that would bring them to the control room. So much trouble, so much death, just to get this far, and they were finally there. A flood of thoughts hit Charlie. These men had given up a lot, in some cases, everything, just to get him here. And it was almost his time. He worried about letting them down. He took a deep breath and shook it off, knowing he was good at his job and would do whatever it took to get the job done. As he walked, stepping around corpses, he gave one a kick to make sure it was actually dead. When he reached the edge of the landing that led down to the final door, he squinted in the dim, flickering light, the emergency bulb damaged. He focused on the floor, not finding any zombies or unmoving bodies. There were just empty space and some darkness by the wall. There was a blinking red light there, and he stared at it for a moment, brow furrowing in confusion. What in the world? he murmured, and then a wave of fear crushed his lungs. Oh my God, he gasped. Oh my God! He thundered down the stairs, his footsteps alerting the soldiers above. He reached the control panel next to the door, babbling as sweat broke out on his brow. No, 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 no! He tapped near the red light, and a full control panel lit up. It was bright enough to show off that the door they needed to get through was made of metal, and very thick. The area that lit up had the outline of a hand, with a large text box reading, Access Denied, in bright red letters across it. Everything okay, Charlie? Garrett asked as he and Preston descended to check on him. You started moving kind of fast. Flashlight! Charlie said, voice devoid of emotion. What? Garrett asked. Flashlight! Charlie snapped, the force in his voice making the soldiers ice cold. They'd never heard the doctor speak this way, nor with such concern, which tensed them both as Garrett handed over the flashlight. What's wrong? Preston asked. Charlie held up a single finger as he turned towards the screen, shining the flashlight on it. There was a handprint scanner, as well as a keyboard and a small monitor readout. As he shone the light on it, it lit up the door for them. That's one hell of a door, Preston muttered. Garrett shook his head as he approached, knocking on it gently. They weren't kidding when they said they took security seriously, he said. The soldiers turned towards Charlie, who was trying to type on the keyboard with one hand, so Garrett took the flashlight and held it for him. I told you, he said. Do what you gotta do. Charlie didn't even look up, intently focused on the screen. He typed for several minutes, muttering to himself as he did. The soldiers shared a wide-eyed gaze of concern. They weren't sure what was happening, but it felt like something was severely not according to plan. Finally, Charlie let out a soft fuck under his breath, and his hands dropped. He backed away from the panel, head hanging. Talk to me, Charlie, Garrett prompted. What's going on? We're fucked. That's what's going on, the doctor replied, flinging a hand towards the door. Preston shook his head. Come on, man, it can't be. It is, Charlie cried. 
his words spitting out like venom. Garrett held his hands up in surrender, keeping his voice as gentle as he could. Charlie, just take a breath, he said, pointing up at the door they'd barricaded. Take a beat and tell me what's going on. The doctor realized that he needed to control the volume of his voice, and took the breath offered to him. Something bad must have gone down in this stairwell, he explained shakily. People panicking, trying to get away from those things, because some dumbass who clearly didn't have access tried to use the handprint scanner too many times. I don't know what that means, Preston admitted. It means they locked the terminal down, Charlie groaned. Garrett shrugged. Okay, so they locked the hand printer down, he said slowly. There's got to be another way to get that door open. Charlie shook his head. You don't understand, he moaned. After too many unauthorized attempts, the entire terminal locks down. No handprint scanner, no passcodes, no nothing. Preston's voice quavered. It can't be nothing, he insisted. There would have to be a fail-safe way to unlock it. Yeah, there is, Charlie scoffed. All we have to do is contact the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in D.C., who has the ability to send someone out with some codes to unlock the terminal. Garrett swallowed hard. Somehow, I don't think that's a viable option, he said dryly. If that isn't the understatement of the day, I don't know what is, Charlie quipped, his voice on the edge of hysteria. But come on, Preston pleaded. I think there has to be some way to get onto that floor. Whatever the way is, it sure as hell doesn't involve opening the door with this terminal, Charlie said. Garrett patted his bag. Got the thermite, he suggested. We can burn our way through. Charlie shook his head. Door is ten inches thick, and it has a bar at the top and bottom securing it, he explained. Even if that device somehow got all the way through, it would still be locked. The trio stood there, dumbfounded for several moments in tense silence. Preston suddenly snapped his fingers, startling everyone. I got it, he said. The elevator. Charlie and Garrett turned towards him, their expressions clear combinations of confusion and pain, as if the idea was so stupid it physically hurt them. The elevator, Garrett drew out the word with a mocking tone. You mean the same elevator we just shoved a hundred zombies on top of? That elevator? That's the one you're speaking of? Unless you know of another one around here, Preston said, rolling his eyes. Garrett waved his hands back and forth in front of his face. Forget getting into the elevator, and forget dealing with the ones that are still kicking and hungry, he said. How are we even going to get to it with those things trapping us in here? We can try our luck with the second floor, Preston said in a sing-song voice. Garrett paused, and then his eyes closed. Son of a bitch, he muttered. Believe me, I'm not thrilled with the idea either, Preston admitted. But do we have another viable option? Or hell, even an unviable one? Garrett clenched his jaw and stared through the ceiling to the heavens, partly to think, but partly to give his brain a break from the absolute nonsense in front of him. Finally, he turned to Charlie, staring him firmly in the eyes. I need you to rack your brain. Think of every computer trick you can possibly think of, Garrett said firmly. Are you 100% sure you can't get this door open from this terminal? Charlie opened his mouth, but Garrett held up a finger to stop him from speaking. That's not racking your brain, he chastised. Take a minute and think. Type on the keyboard. Do some work. Charlie nodded, even though he knew it was locked out for good. He turned and started typing away, pulling up some menus and sub-directories. After a few minutes of humoring the soldier, he turned, shaking his head. Sorry, he said with a shrug. There is nothing I can do from this terminal. Garrett patted him on the shoulder. It's okay, he said and gave his shoulder a squeeze. Now this next question is very, very important. If we can find a way to get into that elevator, are we going to be able to gain access to the floor? Charlie took a deep breath, standing there for a moment, then turned back to the screen and typing for a bit. 
Finally, he turned back around, rubbing his face. In theory, yes, he said. Garrett sighed. In theory, he asked. I'm not going to be sure until I'm in front of it, Charlie admitted. But from what I can tell, the terminal is still active. And if it's active, we can get in. So you're going to hack it? Preston asked. Not exactly, Charlie replied. This terminal went into lockdown, which threw the two deadbolts on the door. The other one hasn't been tripped, so it should be manageable. Plus, it being an elevator door won't be as bad. Preston cocked a brow. Why not? he asked. Safety reasons, mostly, Charlie replied. If there's a fire or power failure where the elevator takes you to the bottom floor, then people are going to need to get off. Most likely, there's a guard at the bottom. Then where's the terminal? Preston asked. Most likely in the elevator, Charlie explained. Like having a key fob at a fancy apartment complex. Can't get to certain levels unless you unlock the button. Garrett nodded, slowly turning. Well, let's hope that's the case, because we're going to have to go through hell to get to that elevator, he said. So, how do you want to play it? Preston asked, throwing up his hands. I mean, it's pretty clear we have to go in through the second floor, and pretty clear our strategy of shoving them down the elevator shaft is out. Garrett sighed. We're going to have to clear the entire floor, he said, either by eliminating the hostiles or locking them in an office. I'm tapped out on bullets, so going to be a lot of stabbing on my part, Preston quipped. Garrett took out his handgun, popping out every round he had. He handed four over to Preston, keeping five for himself. Don't use them unless you absolutely have to, he said. Remember, we still have to fight our way out of here in a few weeks and I sincerely doubt we're going to find more bullets downstairs. Preston nodded as he loaded up the bullets into his gun, both men checking their blades. What do you want me to do? Charlie asked. Garrett shook his head. You're going to stay here in the stairwell, he said firmly. Once we're through that door, I want you to shove as many of those bodies back against it as possible. We'll knock when we're ready for you. The doctor nodded solemnly. Better question. Preston piped up. What do you want us to do? We don't even know what that floor looks like. I heard some moaning in there, Charlie said, so there's definitely something. We're just going to have to do what we do best, Garrett said. Preston sighed. And what's that? he asked dryly. Garrett shrugged. Make shit up as we go. Chapter 6 Nine hours remain. They managed to pull bodies away from the door, far enough so that it would open wide enough for the two soldiers to slip against the door. Garrett pushed his head against it, trying to listen closely. What do you hear? Preston whispered. Garrett shook his head. Definitely hear some movement, he said. Some light moans too. Of course, that space is huge, so God only knows what's actually in there. Let's hope the emergency light works, Preston said. Not sure we're going to want to call attention to ourselves. Agreed, Garrett said. Okay, Charlie, as soon as this door shuts, you push these bodies up against it. It's going to take us a while to clear, so you just sit tight and wait for us to come back. Charlie took a deep breath. And if you don't come back, he asked. Garrett pursed his lips for a moment. Then you eat whatever you want out of your bag, he said softly. "'cause I don't see a water fountain around here, "'so you probably won't need a month's worth of food.' "'Charlie swallowed hard, looking afraid of that answer, "'but nodded. "'Just make sure you come back,' he said. "'When we do, we'll give the shave and a haircut knock,' Preston said. "'Cliché, but that's about the only tune I know, "'and I doubt those things can do it.' "'Okay, I'll be waiting,' Charlie said. "'The two soldiers prepared to enter,' dropping their food packs and readying their weapons, with Charlie ready to replace the barricade. Both men were tense, not sure of what awaited them on the other side, convinced only that whatever it was, it wouldn't be good. Charlie gently turned the handle and pulled it towards him, giving them the room. They slipped inside, with Garrett taking point, standing in a fighting stance as Charlie secured the door behind them. 
They were in a small hallway that looked like it was between two offices. The emergency lighting was spotty, but did enough to illuminate the room so they could get a sense of what was in there. There was movement at the top of the hallway, which was about ten yards long, a few zombies shambling by, not noticing the two men. Past that, there was an open area filled with rows of terminals and electrical equipment. Garrett motioned for Preston to follow, and he did so. They inched up towards the top of the hallway, stopping well before. There was an emergency light at the end, and they paused in the shadows. It wasn't much cover, but they had to take what they could get. They looked out into the room, able to see about forty percent of it, and the hair on the backs of their necks stuck straight up. The floor was littered with sleeping bags and other gear, and there was movement everywhere. Dozens of ghouls all wandering about, some in the open area, some in offices, shambling aimlessly, looking for something fresh to sink their teeth into. Garrett knew they needed to strategize, because this was the only path forward for them. He motioned to Preston to wait as he inched himself up along the wall so he could figure out a game plan. He waited for a few creatures to wander by the opening at the end of the hallway, before moving up. The new vantage point didn't make him feel any better about their situation. The dozens they saw from back in the hallway were just the beginning. The rest of the area was filled with creatures too. Garrett's mind raced. How in the hell are we going to fight a hundred of these things with knives? He thought frantically. He took in a deep breath and carefully stepped out into the main room, looking in through the window of the office next to them. He could see that the door was open, and inside were two ghouls that were focused on a broken mirror at the back of the room. Garrett motioned for Preston to come up, and he gave him the proper hand signals to let him know what the threat in the room was. They took one more look around the open area, making sure nothing was looking at them, before making their move. They stayed low, moving quickly and quietly over a few yards to the door. They snuck inside, the zombies still unaware of their presence. Garrett gently shut the door, turning the knob so that the latch didn't click as it shut. Once secure, the two men moved in unison towards their targets, the two creatures who still hadn't noticed them. Garrett and Preston locked eyes, making sure they were both on the same page, and in one move, they both stood up, jamming their knives into the backs of the zombies' skulls. They quickly wrapped their arms around them, catching them and gently laying the corpses on the ground. They remained quiet and motionless for several moments, wanting to make sure that what little noise they'd made didn't attract any attention. Once they were satisfied, they ducked down behind the desk, speaking low. How in the holy hell are we doing this? Preston asked. Garrett shook his head. I have no clue, he murmured. There's got to be a hundred of those things in there, Preston hissed. I know, Garrett whispered. Come on, we got to figure this out. The two men headed over to the window, looking out of the office, peeking out over the bottom lip of the frame, to stay as concealed as possible. The zombies continued to mill about, mostly reacting to the noise others were making. They looked around the edges of the room, seeing three offices to the wall on the right, which was about twenty yards away. On the left, they couldn't really tell because of the angle, but they could see a few more offices in the distance but mostly open space. Garrett looked at the other wall inside the office, noticing there were small curtains on the wall, which confused him. He went over, pulling them back and seeing there was a decent-sized window behind it, leading into the neighboring office. He quickly let go when he saw a few zombies inside, not wanting to be noticed. He pulled it back ever so slightly, seeing it was a solid pane of glass, with no way to open it. What we got? Preston whispered. Well, if we get trapped, we have a way out, Garrett replied. Kind of. Think we can use it? Preston asked. Garrett shrugged. Maybe, he said, then contemplated for several moments, pulling back the curtain again and looking at the glass. You're not going to like this. Well, if you're leading with that, of course I'm not, Preston muttered. I think I can punch my knife through the glass and pry it off. Garrett said. Preston hesitated, shaking his head. Okay, he asked. How does that help us? We'll have access to that office, 
and can start throwing stuff through, Garrett said. Get those things agitated and make a ruckus. Drawing attention to ourselves, Preston said. Yeah, you're right. I'm not liking this. His companion shook his head. Not attention to us. Attention to the other office, he corrected. Pull as many of those things in there as we can. And then what? Preston asked. Shut the door, Garrett suggested. Block it off. Anything that thins their numbers out there. Preston nodded his head before going back to the front window. He looked out at one of the rows that was right in front of the other office door. There was a tall metal rack filled with parts and boxes. There, we can use that, he said, pointing. Garrett looked out and nodded. Looks sturdy and tall enough, he agreed. Pull it down. Should create a barrier in front of the door. Don't know if it'll permanently hold them, but unless these things are knocked to the ground, they don't tend to crawl. Question is, what do we do after that? Preston asked. That's going to be a hell of a noise. Garrett took a deep breath. We run like hell to the other side, he said. This place is big, and they're pretty spread out. So hit and run? Preston asked. His companion shrugged. Unless you got a better idea, he said. Nah, that works, Preston agreed with a sigh. Where's the meetup point? Garrett motioned as he spoke. Far wall, center office if there is one, he said. Works for me, Preston said. You get the window open and I'll keep watch. Garrett nodded and pulled out his knife, hoping he was right about the window. He put the tip of the blade in the corner of the glass taking a deep breath before acting. With a forceful palm smack to the hilt, the knife punched through the glass, which shattered into a thousand pieces. Apparently, they skimped on the high-grade safety stuff and went for lower-cost glass. The sound resonated in the offices, getting the attention of the zombies in the other room. Garrett quickly turned and grabbed anything he could find off of the desk. Paperweights, staplers, anything heavy that could make noise. He started tossing stuff into the other office, smacking against the far wall. It didn't take long for the two creatures inside to walk over to the window that was about head height, closing off his ability to throw. Garrett pulled out his machete and quickly stabbed through the opening, using the bottom of the window frame as a guide, piercing both of their brains relatively quickly. As they fell, more creatures started to come into the room. Their moans were loud enough to draw more ghouls nearby. Garrett threw the rest of what he had into the room, but the chain reaction had already begun. Within moments, there were a dozen zombies in the room, with more coming in. He pulled the curtain closed on the window before heading back over to Preston. How are we looking? Garrett asked. The office is muffling their moans so it's not pulling too many of them, Preston replied. That's good for us, Garrett replied. Last thing we need is a hundred of those things over there. Ain't that the truth, Preston agreed. They watched for several moments as zombies continued to pour inside, with a trio of creatures losing interest when they heard a moan coming from across the large open space. Guess that's all we're getting, Garrett said. You ready to move? Preston asked. Garrett nodded. Let's do it before the ones inside start coming out, he said. The two soldiers carefully opened the door, heading out into the main room. As soon as they stepped out, one of the zombies in the doorway of the other office spotted them, moaning and shambling forward. Garrett darted up, jamming his knife into the bottom of its chin, straight up into its brain, dropping it. His presence was enough to draw the attention of the ones inside. Move! Preston barked. Garrett hopped back just as he pulled down the heavy metal storage rack. It crashed down with a thunderous sound that resonated all the way through the giant room. The top part of the rack landed halfway up on the door, wedging itself between the doorframe and the mechanical equipment aisle, which was secured to the floor. Garrett looked and saw that the zombies inside were trapped, pressing themselves up against the rack reaching but unable to get out. He looked over to Preston, who was on the other side of the rack, seeing several zombies coming up behind him. Behind you, man! Garrett cried. 
Preston whirled around, pulling his blade up, jamming it in the ghoul's eye before shoving it back. Let's move, he said. The two men spread out, running as hard as they could down different aisles towards the other side of the room. The sounds of moans and the shuffling of feet could be heard all around them, the emergency lighting doing a poor job of preparing them for what was further than ten yards ahead. Garrett ran straight up an aisle towards two creatures that were close together. The aisle was claustrophobic, with only a few feet on either side of him to move in. The creatures were nearly stacked, with the zombie in the back trying to overtake the one in the front, so it was like a two-headed, four-armed beast reaching out. Garrett had his knife out, lowering his left shoulder while leading with the knife in his right hand. He hit the ghouls almost at the same time, the blade finding a head and the shoulder a chest. The creatures hit the ground, the dead one on top of the live one, as Garrett stumbled over them. He managed to keep his footing, though, quickly turning and jamming the blade into the fallen one's head before he continued running. As he approached the cross-aisle intersection that cut through the middle of the equipment row, he saw a dozen or so monsters straight ahead of him. They were a few yards away from the opening, which was his only means of escape. Garrett pumped his legs hard, getting to the opening and making a hard right, hearing multiple moans not only behind him, but ahead as well. The cross aisle stretched on for fifty, sixty yards, and there was movement all ahead of him. He ran to the next opening a few yards away before making the turn back towards the rendezvous point. There were a few zombies in the row, but they were spread out pretty far. He took them out one by one with his knife as he rushed through to the back wall. When he got there, he saw it was mostly just a wall, with no office space. He'd made enough noise along with Preston, who he heard running and fighting off in the distance, and drew a ton of interest in their direction. No office, Garrett yelled. Double back to the stairwell. Yeah, Preston yelled back. The mob coming towards him made noise from every aisle, except for the one he'd just come up. As soon as they came around the corner, they would converge on him. He looked back the way he'd come, finding it empty just a string of corpses on the ground, and an idea formed in his head. He pulled out his flashlight, quickly finding the flashing setting, the one that you would use if you're trying to signal someone that's far away. He flicked it on and underarmed through the light across the ground towards the far corner. The flashlight bounced on the ground several times before rolling, coming to a stop near the corner, and, much to his relief, the light facing back towards him. He ducked back behind the big piece of machinery at the end of the aisle, peeking around the corner. Much to his relief, the fifteen or so zombies that emerged from the various aisles over the next minute or so were immediately attracted to the light, converging on it. Garrett was about to head back to the stairwell, but saw an opportunity. The creatures were all turned away from him, so he came out from hiding, knife in hand, creeping up towards the back of the pack. As he crossed each aisle, he glanced down them, making sure nothing else was nearby. He saw nothing, presuming that the metal rack that fell was pulling everything in that direction. With the ghouls focused on the light, he began stabbing. One creature after another, blade to the back of the skull, drop and repeat. He got through half a dozen before one of them turned and saw him, moaning with excitement. The moan was short-lived, however, as he impaled it with his knife, right between the eyes. The moan was enough to get the attention of the eight or so still there. Garrett managed to stab a couple more before they started pushing in his direction. He took a few steps back, standing his ground and fighting rather than running as they were spread out a couple feet apart from one another, giving him an opening. Garrett stabbed the first one, dropping it before attacking the one behind it. As he took the second one out, he heard moaning coming from behind him. Not wanting to risk a back attack, he stabbed, then kicked it back into the others before blindly darting down the aisle. Fingers brushed his back, narrowly missing grabbing onto him as he fled. When he reached the intersection, looking both ways, he spotted several zombies that were back towards the direction of the stairwell. 
all moving rapidly towards the office they'd trapped the zombies in. Garrett waited for several seconds for them to pass, making sure there weren't any more in that aisle. Once he was sure, he moved over to the aisle, following them down, stalking them like a predator. With two quick stabs, he took them both down. He headed back towards the stairwell, making it to the far aisle against the wall, but he was forced to retreat a bit behind cover when he spotted a ton of zombies all pressed up against the wall of the initial office they were hiding in. He peeked back out, seeing that they weren't focused on the office with the trapped ghouls. Rather, they were trying to get into the office they were in. As he looked, he saw a light flickering on and off from inside. Garrett moved over an aisle, heading down it so he could get a better view, finding Preston still trapped inside. The door was open, but he'd managed to pull the desk over in front of the door. Fucking hell, Garrett thought, and took stock of the situation. He estimated forty or so zombies in front of the office, and then retreated back towards the far end, away from the mob. There were a few stragglers that he dispatched along the way before finally finding a quiet corner. Preston, do you read me? He asked softly into his communicator. About time you called in? Preston snapped. Garrett sighed. What the hell happened? He asked. A few of those things were banging on the stairwell door, so I took them out, which drew too many of them in my direction, Preston explained. Only play I had was to go into the office. I barely managed to get the desk in front before it started getting overwhelming. Garrett swallowed hard. Are you, you know, bit? Preston said dryly. Not yet, but if you don't think of something soon, I damn well will be. I don't know how much longer my legs have before giving out. His voice was full of strain. Give me a second, and I'll pull some away, Garrett promised, and whirled around, thinking and looking. He quickly realized he only really had one option. He pulled out his handgun, walking over to the back of the mob, taking aim at the backs of their heads. He pulled the trigger once, the bullet ripping through two of their skulls, immediately exciting the mob. Yeah, that's right, come get some, he called, backpedaling slowly, continually looking over his shoulder for trouble after announcing his position to every ghoul in the room. About twenty of the zombies from the mob turned to pursue him, packed tightly in the aisle, all struggling to climb over one another to reach him. As he retreated, several more appeared from the other side, so he raced to get to the cross aisle. There were three down there, so he rushed them, tackling one into the others. All of them fell to the ground, and Garrett scrambled to his feet, his entire body burning from the constant battle. Grabbing his knife, and jamming it into one of the skulls. But as he tried to pull it out, it became stuck. He was forced to leave it, giving him only his machete and four bullets. He swung his machete at another ghoul as it tried to get up, before jumping over the other one as the mob continued to pursue him. Realizing he was in deep trouble, and struggling to continue to fight at the pace he was doing so, he decided to pull a risky move. Garrett ran to the far end as quickly as he could, before turning back towards the offices on the far wall. He took out a few stragglers as he went, finally reaching the offices. The first one was completely shut off, barricaded from the inside with several zombies trapped in there, apparently having tried to survive the carnage. He went into the next office, which had a few less ghouls in it. There were more coming towards him, so he quickly ducked inside pulling his handgun and emptying three bullets into the creatures, leaving him with only one left. As they fell, one of the zombies from outside the office reached for him. Garrett reacted quickly, turning and kicking the beast back into the others, before rushing over to the desk and pushing it to the door, blocking it. As the zombie started to pull around the entrance, he called up Preston. You good over there, man? he asked. Yeah, I think I can manage came the reply. Thanks for pulling those things away. Garrett swung at a skull with his machete, taking down a ghoul. You able to take any out by the door? he asked. Should be able to, Preston replied. They're doing a pretty good job of throwing the corpses back trying to get at me. Garrett barked a laugh. 
Apparently you're looking tasty today, he said as he took down another corpse. Oh, you know me. I'm catnip to these things, Preston joked. They shared another laugh, finding solace in one another in the face of such horror. We survived this, and you'll be getting some girls back in Seattle too, Garrett said as he continued to swing and stab. That's a nice thought and all, but I'm not so sure, Preston replied. Garrett couldn't help himself. Desperate women with few options. You'll have a shot, he teased. Preston laughed. Hard to argue that, he quipped. All right, let's clear these things out, Garrett said. Let me know when you're clear, and we'll do a final sweep. Ten-four, Preston replied. Garrett swung again, ending another zombie's afterlife. He stood there for a moment in the face of the gnashing teeth, a bit shell-shocked over how they'd managed to pull this off. For a brief moment, he had hope that they might actually make it through this. Chapter 7 Seven and a half hours remain. Preston, Garrett, and Charlie were all standing by the elevator door, with the two soldiers getting the doors opened. Once they did, they shone their flashlights down the shaft, finding the mass of bodies below, some of them still moving. The top layer of corpses were about ten feet below them. Well, that looks like an unmitigated nightmare, Preston muttered. Garrett sighed. Yeah, not exactly looking forward to this part, Garrett said. Preston turned to him. How are we even going to do this? he asked. Garrett took his flashlight and shone it at the edges of the elevator, at the small gap where a ladder was. It was just wide enough to push off a corpse. Check that out, he said. That should give us some fighting room. Push a few dozen off after we stab any that are even thinking of moving, and that should give us room to move whatever's left on the top of the car to the side, at least far enough so we can get... He choked off his words as a zombie plummeted down from the top of the shaft, landing head first, the crack of its neck echoing. The men looked up with cold realization that the door was still open upstairs. You have got to be fucking kidding me, Garrett huffed. It's raining zombies now? Preston sighed. Guess we're going to have to do this quietly, he said. That's going to slow things down, that's for sure, Garrett said. Only one of us can be in there at a time. Can't risk leaving Charlie by himself. You want the first shift? Preston asked. Garrett held out his fist, and his companion rolled his eyes before mirroring his movement. They tapped their fists in the air three times, Preston throwing paper and Garrett throwing scissors. Preston muttered under his breath as he prepared to enter the shaft. You just keep your eyes peeled up above, he said as he reached out for the cables. I've come this far and would rather not get taken out by a flying zombie. Garrett nodded and helped him as Charlie held the flashlight. Preston slid down to the corpses below, careful to only put his feet on any creatures that weren't moving. Once he was on secure footing, he motioned up to Garrett, who dropped the machete. The blade fell straight down, sticking with a thud into the back of one of the ghouls. Preston carefully picked his way over, pulling the blade free and letting out a sigh as he got to work. Over the course of the next hour, the two soldiers carefully cleared the top of the elevator car, being quiet in doing so, and luckily not attracting any more divers. Finally, the trap door was accessible, and Garrett was the one to flick it open recoiling from the stench as he did. Even with all the horrific smells from the mass of rotted flesh, this was a special scent. He shone his flashlight in, finding the reason why. There were two people inside, dead on the floor, no bite marks, just slit wrists. The stench of their decomposition and the pool of coagulated blood beneath them had been building for weeks released all at once by him opening the top. We're good, he hissed, but might want to let that air out a bit. Preston nodded and helped Charlie over to the cables. They both slid down to the top of the car as Garrett dropped inside, 
kicking the bodies to make doubly sure they were dead. Once he was convinced, he motioned for the others to come down. Charlie looked at the terminal as soon as he hit the floor, finding it active and not locked down. He typed for several moments, nodding as he did so. We should be able to open these doors manually, he said. The soldiers nodded, and Garrett jammed his knife into one of the doors for leverage and pushing. Preston dug his fingers in and helped, and they got the door cracked, but stopped to make sure there was nothing waiting for them on the other side. Much to their relief, it looked like a clean room. There was no movement, no camping gear, nothing. Doesn't look like anybody is down here, Preston said. Finally, something going right. Garrett huffed, and they strained together to get the doors fully open. As they do, they revealed a small security area, with windows all around a standard security door. Presumably there were guards there who would buzz workers in. The three of them walked out, going over to the door to inspect it. It wasn't a particularly strong door, but it was locked up. Think you can get that open? Charlie asked. Garrett nodded before delivering several forceful kicks to it. Eventually it was open, and they walked into the control room. The emergency lighting was bright, showering the entire room in bright light. There were two rows of computer terminals, with a big screen on the wall, all of which were operational. Okay, Charlie, do your thing, Garrett said. Preston and I will secure the area. I'll take care of the elevator door. Preston said. Make sure we don't have any unexpected visitors dropping in. I'll check the sub-basement level, Garrett said. If you need something, Charlie, give us a shout. The doctor nodded as he walked through the various computer terminals, reading what was on each screen and taking note of it. After visiting each of them and looking at the main screen, he searched for a pen and paper, finding one and taking down notes. Finally, he sat at a terminal, typing out a long string of characters. After several minutes, the terminal beeped, and he moved on to the next one. Garrett and Preston eventually came back into the room, standing in the corner and talking amongst themselves quietly as they watched Charlie work. Looks like he's right in his element, Preston murmured. Garrett nodded, checking his watch. Let's hope so, he said. They watched him work for a few more minutes, mesmerized by how he seemed to become a different person, taking command of the situation. Did you ever think we'd get to this point? Preston asked. Garrett shook his head. I thought we were boned as soon as the plane engine took a bullet, he admitted. If it's any consolation, you were nearly right, Preston replied. Unless we can get through that mess above us, I still might be, Garrett said softly. Preston sighed. At least we got here, though, he said. Never dreamed of that over the last couple of days. Charlie glanced up from the terminal. Time? he asked. Little north of six hours, Garrett replied. Charlie looked up as if he were doing some mental math, before smiling and nodding. Preston cocked a brow. So that's a good thing? he asked. Yeah, but you two might want to get comfortable, Charlie said. It's going to be a while. You hungry? Preston asked. Charlie nodded. Yeah, I could eat, he said. We'll get something going then, Preston replied, and the two soldiers wandered off to check out the rest of the area. Off of the main control room was a hallway leading to two restrooms, which they stepped inside to clear. Past that was a small break room just across from them, containing a few snacks, a microwave, and a sink. They approached the sink slowly, pausing with anticipation. Garrett took a deep breath and turned the knob, and relief settled over them as water poured out of the tap. Oh, thank God, Garrett murmured. Just to be on the safe side, we should probably contain her out as much as we can, Preston suggested. Good call, Garrett agreed. The emergency power had the break room running at nearly full capacity, although the refrigerator sounded like it was struggling. They opened it up, amazed that it was still cool. I'm liking this place more and more, Preston quipped. 
Guess they figured if things went bad, people might be stuck here, Garrett said. They went through all the cabinets, finding several bowls and dishes. As Garrett pulled some out, Preston started unloading the various food bags. So, what do you think? he asked. Dry pasta or oatmeal? I think pasta, Garrett replied. Carving up after the week we've had might be a good idea. Preston nodded, holding up a box. We'll eat big with this one because I don't remember the last time we ate well, he said. Then we can figure out rationing based on what Seattle is able to tell us. Garrett nodded. I'll get some water boiling in the microwave and we'll have us a feast, he said. Chapter 8 Two Hours Remain Garrett and Preston sat in the corner playing poker, using a pile of paper clips they'd found in one of the desk drawers as chips. I'll take two, Garrett said, and his companion slid two cards over as Garrett playfully studied him, looking deep into his soul as if he was sitting at the final table of a Las Vegas poker tournament. In a deadly serious tone, he said, Raise your three clips. Preston grinned, sliding in three clips from his stack. I'll call your bluff, he drawled. They stared at each other intensely, before Garrett slammed his cards down on the table. Fine, take your winnings and go, he scoffed. Preston cracked up, flipping his cards over, showing that he had a pair of kings and nothing else. Man, if you can't beat that, then why are you betting? he asked. Garrett rolled his eyes and grabbed the deck, shuffling. Yeah, well, I'm going to get you this hand, he promised. As he started to shuffle, Charlie clapped his hands together loudly, standing up with his arms in the air. I got it, he cried. I got it! Both soldiers got up, walking over to the doctor who wore a wide grin of pride. So, the plan is safe? Garrett asked. Yep, it's back online and all the problems are stabilizing, Charlie said, beaming. Going to have to monitor it for the next few days to make sure nothing needs to be tweaked, but we're out of danger. Have you been able to reach Seattle? Preston asked as he stared at the screen. Charlie shook his head. Not yet. I had to do some work to repair a glitch in the communication program, he said. It's rebooting now, so I should be able to open up a window in the next minute or so. Garrett let out a whoop and smacked Charlie on the back, maybe a little too hard by the shock on the doctor's face. He smiled and accepted it even as he flinched. Damn fine job, Charlie, Garrett said. Damn fine job. Thanks, the doctor replied. You guys got me here. I wasn't going to let you down. Sarge and the others would be proud, Preston said, his eyes glassing over a little. You honored their sacrifice. Charlie nodded solemnly. Just pulling my weight, he said softly. The terminal beeped and an instant messenger screen popped up. At the top of the box it read, Connected. All right, let's let them know we're here, Charlie said and took his seat beginning to type. Greetings from Southern California. Anybody home? There was no immediate response and they waited for a solid minute with bated breath for someone to respond. Finally, a message came up. We read you, SoCal. Stand by. The trio of men gasped in relief, watching the screen intently as they waited a response. Communication with the plant is confirmed. We have control here. Good job. Charlie nodded, typing furiously. Thanks. We do what we can. Now we need to talk about rescue. There was another long pause before the response popped up. I need to retrieve someone higher up. In the meantime, what is your status? Charlie glanced up at Garrett. How bleak of a picture should I paint? He asked. Make it sound bad enough that it forces the hand to act, but not bad enough that rescue seems impossible. Garrett quipped. Charlie sighed. Oh, that sounds like a fun line to dance on, he muttered. He pursed his lips, contemplating hard before typing. Sergeant Wrangle and three others are KIA. Facility is surrounded by zombies, but an air rescue is possible. They sat there, looking at each other, 
concerned at what the answer would be. Well, let's hope they realize just how valuable of a commodity you are, Preston said, clapping Charlie on the shoulder. The doctor took a deep breath. Damn straight, he murmured. Several more tense minutes passed in silence as they stared at the blinking cursor on the screen. Situation in Seattle is improving, but other priorities are taking precedence. How long can you hold out? Charlie looked up at the others, hoping they had an answer for that. I've never had a ration before, he admitted. Based on what we have, what's the maximum amount of time we can skate by and still have the strength to get topside? If we average one and a half meals a day, we can stretch it to five weeks, Garrett replied. Anything less than that, and we're going to be feeling it in a big way. Charlie pursed his lips for a beat before responding. Food will become extremely scarce within four weeks, he typed back. Water supply is steady. After another long, very uncomfortable pause, the response came. We'll take under advisement. Stretch food to maximum. We will keep you up to date with the status of a potential rescue mission. Out. Charlie blinked in shock at the screen, putting his hands on the keyboard. But Garrett put a hand on his arm. What the hell does that mean? Charlie cried. The soldiers shared a concerned look, shaking their heads. You want to tell him? Preston asked. Charlie grunted. Tell me what? He demanded. It means we're going to be a bullet point on the next meeting of the bigwigs. Garrett said. I still don't know what that means, Charlie gritted out. Preston sighed. It means we better hope we have someone in our corner fighting for us during that meeting, he clarified. And if we don't? Charlie asked, an edge of hysteria to his voice. If we don't, it means you have a choice, Garrett replied softly. What choice? the doctor demanded, clearly annoyed with the whole conversation. The choice between dry pasta and oatmeal is your last meal, Garrett said. Charlie went pale, his eyes widening in fear. Don't worry, Garrett patted his shoulder. Somebody up there has got to know just how valuable you are. I'm sure they will come for us. Regardless, we do know for a fact that it wasn't going to be for a good long while, so we might as well get comfortable, Preston said brightly. Yeah, hope you know some card games, Garrett added because that's about all we have to pass the time. That and sleep, Preston said. I feel like I could sleep straight through until the rescue. Come on, couple more hands before you pack it in, Garrett said. I want a chance to win my paper clips back. Preston rolled his eyes. With the way you bluff, you might as well just hand them over and get a good night's rest, he teased. The soldiers laughed as they walked back to the card game, hoping their lighter tones were putting Charlie at ease. They both knew it was, at best, a 50-50 chance they'd be rescued, but there was no sense in worrying the doctor about that. Come on, they're driving now, Garrett said. You've earned a break. Charlie looked at the screen, reading that last line over and over again. Finally, something clicked in his mind, and he burst out laughing. Garrett's brow furrowed in concern, and he looked back at him. What is it? he asked. I just realized how I can make sure they come and rescue us, the doctor said. How's that? Preston asked, straightening. Well, I do still have control here, Charlie explained. If they don't have a plan for us in a couple of weeks, I'll just casually mention what a shame it would be if I accidentally melted this place down by hitting some keys while I'm dying from starvation. He smirked. You know, accidentally, of course, being out of my head and all. The soldiers laughed applauding the idea. Charlie, you are one cold motherfucker, Garrett guffawed. I love it. Now come on over and get dealt in. Charlie walked by the last computer terminal, which had a small container of paperclips left. He grabbed it and popped the top off before sitting down, a spring in his step. He pulled out two clips and tossed them in the middle of the table. And he is in, he declared. Deal him up. The men did their best to enjoy their game and relax a bit after the madness they had to endure. They did their best to put on a happy face, even though they knew deep down that the room they were in could very well be their tomb. Even with the potential for a slow, agonizing death, all three of them sat with pride. 
They knew they'd pulled off a miracle, and tens of thousands of people were going to have a chance at a long life because of it. The End <laughs>